It's a huge pleasure for me to be back at Morfields, where I've been working for two years and I'm still working. Um, it's also a great pleasure to present you some of the basic ideas how eventually a drug therapy for stargards could potentially work one day. And it's also, I admit, a challenge. So first of all, I apologize if I start my talk with some slides that are presenting details you probably already know since Anais and James and Andrew's talks the latest. So I do not have any financial interests to start. And so the questions I try to tackle now in the next 15 minutes is, how could pills to treat stargards eventually work? I mean, it's a nice idea to have the concept or the idea to take a pill one day, once a day or twice a day, and it should prevent or slow down the progression of stargards disease. And to introduce you to the concept, um, I, as I said, I go back. We know that the eye is working like a, a camera and the retina is, so to say, like the film. You have been already been told today several times that the retina consists of several layers. And one layer, or the special layers we are interested in, are the photoreceptors. So the seeing cells, the cells that are able to recognize the light. And I will concentrate also what has been mentioned in the two talks uh, before, the retinal pigment epithelium cells. Because the pigmented epithelial cells do not have only a supportive layer, if I'm looking at this, um, for, for each other, but between the two layers of the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium, there's also something else in very interesting happening. And this is the basic concept of recycling. So if you hear the word recycling, first of all, most of you will think about the garbage and how we can reuse it. And I can tell you the Austrian and the Germans are very good in recycling and how to, <laughs> <laughs> and how to separate the, 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 the garbage and to reuse it. But it's a very intelligent way that the biology and our eye have developed with the evolution because such a recycling is happening between the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium as well. And the thing that is recycled is this uh, visual pigment. So don't pay too much attention, please, on the, on the names that the chemists have given there. Just, I want now to, with you, only concentrate on the, on the concept that the visual pigment is more or less the molecule that is stored in our photoreceptor cells in the rods and cones, and that is hit by light, and based on that the light is hitting this molecule, the molecule is changing its formation and creating an electric stimulus that is transported as a signal to the brain. But once this molecule has been used and consumed, it's not available anymore, so it's more or less would be garbage. And what is happening then, a cascade or like a circle is starting. So it starts its configuration from one molecule to the other, is then delivered from the photoreceptor cells to the RPE cells, is firmer transformed, and is then given back to the photoreceptor cells. And when the cycle is finished again, it would be ready and the next light can hit again our molecule. So this is going in circle and circle and circle. And this is very good um, and it's great. But unfortunately, wherever you have such processes, there can also be byproducts. And the chemists are not very creative. They have always, always such funny names, like in this one, the A2E, that is such a byproduct. And what uh, A2E is, it's a major part of this um, uh, material that is called lipofuscin or lipofusion. I've heard both names in America, in the, uh, how you pronounce it in, in America and here in the UK. So choose away lipofuscin or lipofusion. And we know that lipofuscin or lipofusion is happening in the retina of everybody, even in a normal fundus of a healthy subject. And we also know that it is one of the major constituents of the flags that we find in Stargard disease, these are these yellowish deposits. And it is known or believed, as had been told this morning, that higher concentrations of these lipofuscin or A2E are 
should lead to cell death, <coughs> what is called to be cytotoxic, and so that then the retinal pigment epithelial and the photoreceptor are dying away. We can also look at this if it's with a special uh, imaging method that is called fundus autofluorescence. So the lipofuscin is showing up when you hit with a blue light into the eye with a camera, and I'm pretty sure for the standard patients, most of your ophthalmologists have already done this. And then you see again the flags that are very bright, and in the dark spots where there's atrophy, where the cells have gone, it's dark because nothing is lightening up. So you can use and also now a newer imaging methodology allows us to quantify the lipofuscin to, so I, and so to say indirectly in a living patient or in a living animal to quantify how much of this debris material is there in the retina. And as I said, we can also find this in healthy subjects. Now, what is for coming back now to the, to the idea of a, of a pharmacological approach, um, we know that we have now said the formation of more than 50% of this lipofuscin are also due to vitamin A because this is one of the major constituents of the visual pigment. And we know also from animal models that the supplementation of vitamin A leads to an increased levels of these toxic A2E. And what I put here, or what has been put here, is that these are some um, um, approaches with aldehyde traps or with RBP4 antagonists, these are again some strange names, or deuterated vitamin A, how the building up and the production of these um, possible harmful compounds should be reduced. And as my time is limited, I wanted only now to con uh, concentrate on one very interesting approach, and that is called it deuterated vitamin A. So several compounds are investigated, and this deuterated vitamin A is not more or less a normal vitamin A that has been only slightly changed at one special position where a little atom has been added. And it has, was supposed, based on the preliminary results from the dishes, that the formation of lipofuscin should be inhibited. And what has been done, it has been done, used a an, an mouse model, the so-called ABCA4 knockout mouse, and that means these are mice that have been um, modified in their genes. So the whole ABCA4 gene where the mutations are causing stargards is missing, and hence these mice behave like us more or less stargard mice. And what has happened, so you, with the mice it's very easy. You can control in the laboratory their diet, and either, the, either you feed them with a normal vitamin A, or you feed them with this modified deuterated vitamin A. And what happened after this has been treated for or fed with the deuterated vitamin A for nine months, the retina has been taken. And as you can see between the control group and the treated group, that there's much less of this pigment, what you can, what you can see of the lipofuscin. And if you quantify the amount of these toxic products of these A2E, then you see that, that the control mouse the blue one has quite a lot, and it's a significant less of the treated one, and indeed it's a treated one with the deuterated vitamin A was around the same like a wild type, that means like a normal mouse with a normal function in ABCA4 gene, and these had a rough, roughly the same amount of A2E. And I've shown you this picture of the fundus autofluorescence, when we can quantify how much is the signal that is coming from this lipofuscin from the retina, and if the intensity of this fluorescence, how much it, it's, it's lightening up. If this was controlled, then there was not a huge difference, a small difference between the wild types, between the controls and the treated, because we, this has been also tried. And compared again with this Stargard mouse that has been the normal vitamin A, and compared with the one that were treated, you could also see that this was a rough the same like the wild type again when these stargard mice have been treat, uh, fed with the deuterated vitamin A. So it was significantly lowered. And what has been also done with these mice, there were different treatment groups over the nine months period. So the first group with, of stargard mice only became the, the normal vitamin A in the diet and all the other conditions like 12 uh, hours per day in the light and uh, 12 hours in the dark because the light kept, 
can also have an impact, um, were always treated with the normal vitamin A. The second group was treated for six months with vitamin A, A, A with normal vitamin A, and then with this modified deuterated vitamin A. The third group was only three months and then six months treated, and then only 1.5 months. And then we had also a group that were all treated all the way down. And we could, and the, it has been also shown with that uh, group of three months treated and then put on a diet. And if we are now looking again at the fundus autofluorescence intensity of this mice, then we could find something very interesting. We could see that our first group that only got the normal vitamin A was in always increasing, increasing, increasing to the highest degree after nine months with lipofuscin accumulation or indirect measurement of this one, while the one who was always on the diet with the deuterated vitamin A was the one that was less. And as soon as you changed from a normal diet from the vitamin A to this uh, deuterated modified vitamin A, you could see that the progression of accumulation was slowing down significantly. And the one that we were treated were, again, what we have already seen, close to the wild type. So what has been done, that was great. And now it come, we come to the sad part that Anai has already said. Unfortunately, animals models do mimic the disease, but are not always transferable one-to-one -to, -one to human disease. And unfortunately, human biology does not always behave the same. But what has been done after this first <coughs> encouraging results, there was in January 2015 a phase one safety study in healthy volunteers to see whether these deuterated vitamin A would have any impact on liver function, especially liver function or anything else. And the good news was that there were no, at least for the four, month, four weeks these people were treated, no severe side effects. And currently, um, at the Wilmer Rye Institute, where I started, uh, I've been working before joining Morfields, they started in August 2015 with the first Stargard patient who has been enrolled. Now, several sites in the US are doing, performing this as a study where the p uh, patients are, for a short period of time, Stargard patients, molecularly confirmed, are treated with this deuterated vitamin A for four months, uh, four weeks, and it is controlled as well. So we will see based on these results, um, how it will, will work in humans. So based on the results I showed you before, I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful, of course. Um, but we have to see how human biology behaves. If this should be successful, then the company is also considering to expand to Europe and, of course, also to the UK. So this is one approach that I could show you. Another approach I wanted to say that is now less and that we are always also now looking, or my, my former colleagues at Wilma are looking, that is called oxidative stress. You have already heard, I'm, I'm pretty sure the word oxidative stress. Oxidative stress means that oxygen radicals or very aggressive atoms are built up that can then attack, for example, cell membranes or cell walls and lead to um, uh, cell damage. There are several um, causes like stress, poor diet, atmospheric pollution, especially ultraviolet rays that's important for us now with the eyes. Or if photoreceptors are dying away, rods or cones, then it could be that not as much oxygen is used that has, is but it's also but it's supp uh, supplied to the eye. And then all of these radicals can build up and can attack the remaining cells. So um, what we did, we want to see how these, the balance between the free radicals and antioxidants uh, behave. And we did this in a different retinal dystrophy, not in Stargardt, but the first one we did in retinitis pigmentosa. We were investigating in the aqueous humor of the eye. We took vit uh, anterior chamber taps and were, were looking for um, molecules that are indicating cell death and oxidative stress and could find uh, in these patients with retinitis pigmentosa um, a significant difference. Um, my previous mentor, Peter Campotaro, is investigating an acetylcysteine NAC that is an antioxidant that is orally bioavailable and can um, give this the drinking water and can also be given to infants. It is already approved for intoxications with paracetamol or as, as a mucolytic. And this has been done in 2011 with 
retinitis pigmentosa mice, and it could be seen when this neck is provided to the drinking water in different dosages, the higher the dosage is, um, then these mice who develop retinitis pigmentosa, if you stain the cells, then you could see that with the highest supplementation of this antioxidant was the higher the survival rate in, the pay in these mice with retinitis pigmentosa was. And this is now also currently investigated in patients with retinitis pigmentosa. And as the Wilmer researchers believe that NAC might also play a role in Stargardt's disease, there's currently a Stargardt trial under investigations where Stargardt patients um, also receive these anterior chamber taps to see whether oxidative stress plays a major role in Stargardt. And then it might be conceivable that also such additional complementary therapies might work to support the survival as neuroprotections or neuroprotectors um, to help the survival and to slow down Stargardt disease as well. So I can't promise anything, but the sunrise at, at the Chesapeake Bay, Maryland is very nice and we should take this a little bit. And with, these are my best wishes with the last slide, my very best wishes from Austria. <laughs> I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Rupert. Um, is there any questions for Rupert about anything you've heard during his presentation? You mentioned about this antioxidant. Is it available naturally in any food? That, because you've mentioned something that people are going to go, oh, I wonder if I can get that. Is it, is it available in any, any vegetable or anything naturally? No, it is not. It is not. It is a chemically modified vitamin A. I mean, this, so you, you don't have it, you have only the normal vitamin A in, in the food. And having that said, to, if you want to go deeper in the, in the understanding of this, um, you must also say that the, these patients that are now treated with this modified vitamin A have to even further reduce her normal vitamin A intake so that this modified vitamin A is now the major part in the blood and is the major part that is consumed by the RPE cells and by, this, by the layers. And it was also one of the downsides that it took the highest dosage because in the safety trials they tried different dosages. How much do you have to supplement with this deuterated vitamin A as a pill um, to get enough dosages in, 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 in the blood that is brought to the uh, to the eye and replaced by the by the by uh, it's in replacing the normal vitamin a okay so it has they had to use the highest dosages and these people have even more that are now participating in the in these treatment trials have now really like it was with the mice it was easy they didn't get any normal vitamin a only these this modified vitamin A, or that's also probably why the results are now so impressive, okay? This is not transferable one-to-one -one if you are uh, a patient and if you have, if you have an, uh, somehow an, a normal diet still. But again, it should be now complementary. It is not naturally available, unfortunately. It's, that's the reason why it is still called a, ph a pharmacotherapy. But I think based on the fact that at, as far as we could see so far, so far, it's, it's, this might change because it was only four weeks and we don't have any long-term results yet. But as, lo as much as we could see now, there were no severe side effects, at least in short term. The long term we have to see for other processes in our body that involve vitamin A. It's, uh, vitamin A is not only involved in the retina, it's also involved in, in, in other biochemical processes. Thank you.